freak out. We're here in the Innovation Lab, the iLab, where you teach one of the most popular courses at Harvard Business School on design thinking. But you're an accounting professor. Used to be. <laughs> Used to be an accounting <laughs> professor. How did you find yourself in this space of design thinking? So it came, uh, Dan, from the work that David Garvin, Patrick Cullen, and I did on rethinking the MBA. One of the things we had heard from a lot of executives was the need to train our students to work on unstructured problems, uh, think more innovatively about uh, solutions, break their fixed ways of thinking. And among the recommendations that we had made, that came back to us a number of times as one that people were perhaps having the most difficulty with. And it, the difficulty uh, came from two, uh, for two reasons. One is, you know, it's a, the pedagogy is different. You've got to sort of do this in a different way and how do we actually implement that pedagogy. And then there's a skill. You need to develop the skill to do it. So a little bit similar to what we had talked about before. I was due for a sabbatical. And I said to myself, you know, we have made this recommendation based on what we heard at the design school. But, and we're seeing people have great interest in implementing this particular uh, way of thinking and uh, way of uh, teaching innovation. But we haven't, there doesn't seem to be a, a way in which people can actually do it. And I know we had started a few seminars on that in that area, but I wanted to just say, let's learn it for myself. And the best way to learn something, of course, is to teach it. So I went on sabbatical. I traveled to all countries, uh, many, all continents other than, uh, if you want to, so not Antarctica, not <laughs> Greenland, but every other uh, continent, but uh, just to try and understand what this whole field is about. And that got me, as I went into it, I got more and more and more excited about it and said, you know, this is going to be something that I think uh, management schools ought to really embrace a lot more. It's something that I had to be convinced can be learnt. I don't think it can be taught, but it can be learnt. That if in fact we use these pedagogies, people can learn to be more innovative, more creative, more empathetic. And the course basically has, uh, I'd say, four big components. The first is deep understanding and insight. So you think about if you're designing a new product, by the way, if you're redesigning a curriculum, mm -hmm. and in fact, in some of my sessions that I've now led on curriculum redesign, I've actually done it using a design thinking approach. So I've tried to combine how do you think about the content of curriculum redesign with the process of using design thinking to think about that content. So you can, be, you can, one of the most powerful experiences I had was one of my students using design thinking to think about the if in impact they have on others. I can redesign how I'm coming across to other people. So you can apply it to business models, services, uh, products, anything. And there are four components. First is, how do I deeply understand, let's say I'm designing a product, how that product might be used by a con consumer or a customer. So that requires empathy, understanding, and insight. First, very much of being skills, if you will, you know, that we had talked about in Rethinking the MBA. The second is around problem framing, how do you frame a problem correctly, and how do you break fixed ways of thinking? There are many kinds of fixednesses that we have. The more expert you are on anything, the more fixed you become because you have a particular approach that you're constantly going to use. So your fixedness that we refer to as functional fixedness, where you think that certain things, certain functions are only to be attributed to certain kinds of products. So, um, uh, you know, for example, if I'm, uh, if I own a car, I might have a functional fixedness that says the function of the car is to only transport my family. 
Well, if I break that functional fixedness and say, no, maybe if I own a car, I might use it to transport somebody else, you might be able to come up with the idea of Uber or Lyft, where you know, you're using the product in a completely different way than the function that you had already always assumed that uh, product to be used for. You might have structural fixedness, which says that everything ought to be structured in a particular way. And for example, in the earlier discussion when we were talking about the flipped classroom, the technique we use is division where we actually take a step that comes later in the process and move it up front and see, does that result in something different? Might it be helpful to actually have someone read before they come to class, even though they have not learned that material, and have a discussion in class? You might have relational fixedness that says that there must be a certain relationship that must always exist between how things happen. So for instance, in the case of uh, insurance products, the relational fixedness has been that I pay my premium. If I'm well, nobody worries about anything that I do. But if I'm unwell, then the insurance company will pay for doctor's bills and so hospital stays and so on. Well, might I break that? Might I say that I want to create an incentive for people to actually stay well? And that if you try to stay well, I'll give you a reward for it. I'm breaking a relational fixedness that says, that insurance should only, is only there to look after me when I'm unwell, but it doesn't impose on me any requirement that I stay well. There's cognitive fixedness, there are many fixednesses. And the beauty of some of the work that I saw at different design firms is how they have systematically broken that kind of fixedness. And I thought, how powerful a way of thinking about getting at this, different ways of thinking, so that is uh, talking about knowing. The next step, the third step in, so breaking fixedness is the second, deep understanding insight is the first, breaking fixedness is the second. Third step is rapid prototyping. That all too often, whether we're redesigning curricula, or redesigning products, we want to make the perfect product and then go out and figure out whether in fact that product has worked very well. And what design thinking argues and innovative thinking argues is that you prototype stuff. You ask a critical question that you want to have answered and go test it and learn from it. The idea is this very interesting phrase that you uh, fail early and often to succeed sooner because you're learning all the time. So for instance, when Google was designing uh, the Google Glass, where the idea was that if I'm looking at my cell phone, now I'm out of the real world. I mean, my virtual world. But they thought, if I have, a, if I have something here, in, right in my eyesight, Maybe I can be in the real world and the virtual world at the same time. That's a major idea. So, but they didn't wait to develop the whole Google Glass to figure out if this was possible. They prototyped it. And the prototype took them one day. Within one day, they were able to see whether in fact it is even possible that you can be in the real world and the virtual world at the same time. And once they figured that out, then there are other things. It might be too heavy. If it's too heavy, then will it hurt my nose? I don't have to develop the product. I can figure out how much the weight that my nose can take. They had this amazing thing where they put more weight at the back of the ears so that there's less pressure. The ears can take a lot more weight than the nose. So then I'm, how do you move it? There are many things you can test, but it just fundamentally breaks the idea that if you're trying to innovate, you don't necessarily wait for the whole product to come, then launch it. You keep doing and testing, doing and testing, so that you, so that it got at this doing skill rather than, you know, just imagining or, uh, get or, or uh, conceptualizing and then, of course that's important, but what design thinking talks about is test as fast as you can. And then the last stage is one of implementation and execution, which is a, a, a skill that we've already done. But these first three, I don't think we do very much in MBA programs. So you were inspired and, by this work on rethinking the MBA. And it came entirely from rethinking wow. the MBA, then going on sabbatical, sensing that this, and even when we were writing the book and writing the case studies on it, it was a very powerful set of ideas that fundamentally changed. And then the way I would close this, this last point that I'm making is, if you think about what we do in management schools and business schools, there's this whole operation cycle, very important part of what we do might involve, uh, you know, the deliberate design, of course, but there's manufacturing, marketing, distribution, you know, these are all important parts of operations. 
Sitting here is the innovation cycle that actually interacts with the operation cycle. And a large part of what we end up doing in, in either recruiting people, training people, developing people, is developing them for the operation world. And it has a very interesting set of rules in the operation world. You know, it's decision making, rational TQM, procedures, checklists, process. These are all good. But as you start applying that to the innovation world, it doesn't work so well. So innovation world is experimenting, connecting, connecting dots, uh, exploring, uh, prototyping, trying. You know, and that's a different set of skills. And what I learned as I was designing this course is that you need both set of skills. No, you can't only run with these. And you need to apply the skills appropriately. So when I'm thinking of innovating, I've got to think about these skills. And I've got to develop my way of thinking to develop those skills. And when I'm in the operational world, I need to use these other skills that I was talking about. Rational TQM, decision making. Uh, and that we had spent a lot of time on developing very good skills for the operation world. But had we spent enough time on developing the skills needed for the innovation world, and of course, rethinking the MBA argued that we had not. And as we kept doing more and more of that work and uh, just seeing and talking to a lot of companies, design firms and companies that were doing it, I became more and more convinced that this was a very important skill for management schools and business schools to develop and that led to the course. I hear that you're trying to combine design thinking with big data, with data analytics. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your vision there and how you see that evolving. So that's again another thing that, uh, as you were describing earlier in our earlier conversation, there's, you know, the world has moved to lots of data getting collected. And that led to very interesting things on data analytics. So that has gone all the way from predicting how someone might want to buy products and goods to, of course, understanding things like spam that we uh, all automatically see. That's basically a machine learning algorithm that suggests that when something comes in, move it to the spam folder rather than serve it to me in my inbox. Uh, IBM Watson, for instance, is doing this amazing stuff on how you might be able to uh, use machine learning and uh, data analytics to treat diseases. So in fact, there's some fabulous work they've done around cancer and how might you identify the correct treatments for cancer depending upon how patients are presenting themselves to the doctor. So as I saw this work in, in several of my other companies that I work closely with either on their boards or otherwise, I had seen this big move towards data coming in and how do I use this data and that this data rich source is a very valuable asset that a company has. And in my design thinking work, that was a different world. I was talking about empathy and understanding the being part. I was talking about prototyping the doing part. I was talking about breaking fixedness, the knowing part. So, yeah, but it didn't involve all this data, heavy data usage. And I said, you know, there's all this heavy data coming in over here, but as I'm doing this design thinking, it's more human-centered learning. And this whole topic is one of machine learning. This is driven by computer scientists, uh, people who understand a lot of statistics, you know. And this is more people who have, uh, you know, a more liberal arts education, more uh, understanding of humans, anthropology, sociology, you know, that kind of uh, uh, skill. And I said, is there an opportunity to actually believe, uh, think that both types of learning will, in fact, for a particular problem, be extremely valuable. Maybe there are, in a particular problem, there are areas where one can use machine learning, which would be a very powerful way to understand what's happening. And maybe there are areas where I need to use human-centered learning. And that, in fact, although these skills appear to be very different than they are, the opportunity to combine them to get much more powerful insights into what's happening in organizations and helping organizations do what they do might be great. So I said, you know, one more of those things. Let me try and see if I might learn uh, uh, machine learning and uh, big data and data analytics and so on. Again, uh, a very 
just as I said in the case of design thinking, I talked to a lot of design firms, helped, several of them came to Harvard to help me design that course. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, person I knew at LinkedIn who was very interested in teaching this course uh, at Harvard with me, so the two of us hooked up together to offer this course on uh, uh, big data at Harvard. What is very interesting about it uh, though, Dan, is that uh, as you think about uh, big data and machine learning, the critical thinking parts of it, which we had also talked about in rethinking the MBA, I had wondered whether as a result of all this machine learning going on, does that mean that the need for critical thinking decreases because the machine is already doing all that learning and uh, coming, up to, coming up with these judgments. So does that mean critical thinking that we had written about in rethinking the MBA we need less of, which of course you need lots of critical thinking. If you don't have much data, you've got to think through what the possibilities might be here. I've got lots of data, do I need it? And what was fascinating as we were teaching this course is how important it is that if you're going to do any course on data analytics and, and machine learning, you need to teach even more of critical thinking than what one might have thought because there's data coming at you, it's coming up with certain kinds of rules or decisions and I've got to really think about whether in my particular context those rules and decisions make sense or not. So I'm now not surprised by the predictions that managers who understand th that is as this data explosion continues, the number of managers we will need who understand data is going to be, I don't know whether it's five times, eight times, ten times, but it's going to be that kind of number more than the manage, than the people who we would just call as data scientists who can actually organize the data. So the people who need to use the data, most statistics and most uh, uh, estimates suggest that we're going to need many, many more managers who know how to work with and use the data and apply critical thinking to the data then we would need data scientists who are actually going to develop the algorithms that will give us the data or the, the, the conclusions from the data or the insights from the data that they can work with. But then managers are going to have to take all this data, understand exactly what the data scientists did and use that to make decisions. We're going to need far more of those managers than we're going to need the people who are actually going to be the data scientists. And that become became very clear to me as I kept doing this work and also became very clear as to why as we think of this new era business schools are going to have to figure out how do I actually combine uh, this whole fear this whole plethora of data that we are getting and train managers who can really look at that data and yeah. be comfortable making yeah. decisions with it.